Ihop is actually it's a mashup of two Swedish words. Uh, Ihop means together, and hop means hope. So our project is about hope and togetherness. The idea is that I really don't like to use the word refugees because sometimes people take part in a project knowing, okay, we're taking part in this because we are refugees, because it's part of this establishing program that the government has for us. And then they start to have like different expectations about what it is. And why we say local community members is because in Sweden you have like you've had a lot of migration since the 80s and the 90s. So you can have a Swede who is not the white Swede, a Swede of Iranian background, a Swede of a Greek background. You can have expats who are living there, who are working there. For example, we've had an Italian girl and a French girl. They are living and working there. So we, we tried as much as we can not to be um, exclusive but to be inclusive. So anybody who wants to take part, we never specified any age group either. So not to exclude any part. The question of the borders started basically with colonialism. I mean, if you look at the Levant, um, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, I mean, they, they never had borders. Egypt and Sudan, they were one country. So, I mean, the whole idea of putting borders and drawing countries is started with colonialism. And it's, it's really fascinating how you see it now. It's not just about refugees or people who are leaving their home countries unwillingly, because it is some kind of, um, I think the, the correct term is um, um, like the, the migrants who really had to move you know, and leave their countries because of war, because of climate change, uh, because of uh, human rights, LGBT rights. And now you see it, it's, it's not just about them. It's also like there are discourses of borders, um, Sweden and Denmark, which is only linked by a bridge. They had the border closed for more than one year. You had like border control. People, there are many people who are living in Malmö and working in Copenhagen and the other way around. They had to go every day through border check. And it's just, it doesn't work. It's two, 2017, it's 2017. I mean, this whole thing about border control and promoting something that you are open, that there are certain values that you are for. But on the other hand, people who are escaping for their lives, you decide let's put border control and let's really feed the hatred, Islamophobia, homophobia by just like borders. So the borders, they start here before they are physical on the ground. I mean, the EU is going through one of its biggest crises since it first started. And um, I mean, it's facing internal crisis, external crisis. And what we call the refugee crisis is not a crisis of refugees coming, it's a crisis of institutions who are not able to organize. There are countries that we thought, we as people from outside the EU, as myself, who is not a European national, we thought that the EU was way more organized, there was more hegemony, um, there was more like really a rule of law in the sense that if the EU will say there are these quotas and you need to do this, that people would respect that. We believe that there are human rights, that the EU, and, and this is why they won the Nobel Peace Prize. I mean, all of these images that we have with the first real test of people escaping for their lives, it became a crisis. Countries are like, Right wing is winning over, populism is, is on the rise. We see it in Sweden, we see it outside Sweden. Um, racism, xenophobia, Islamophobia, all of this is rising. So I think the EU needs to be more strict about the right wing discourse and the whole question of freedom of expression. Freedom of expression was not made for hate speech. Freedom of expression was made for respect of human rights. And human rights does not mean hate speech by all means. It means solidarity, it means support, it means open borders. 
Can I like be a little bit long? Um, the first time I moved to Sweden was in 2013 when I wanted to do my master's. And I lived in Malmö, which is known to be the most diverse city probably in all of Europe. The, the Arabs are the majority in, in Arab Swedes or Arabs who just moved recently. And at that time, there was no dash, there was no uh, mass influx of refugees. And it was really like normal. You would hear that there is a right wing that is trying to reach the percentage of 5% to reach, to have seats in the parliament and so on. And that was in 2014, like, like three years ago. And nowadays, let me tell you that last month, at the Gothenburg Book Fair, there was a huge debate all over Sweden because the Nordic resistance movement, which is a neo-Nazi, clear neo-Nazi movement, they asked for demonstration and they were granted the right to demonstrate. And it was a whole dilemma whether we should allow this to happen or not. And you will see, of course, people who support this out of freedom of expression. But on the other hand, you saw a lot of people who also decided to take the street to show that we are present. Yes, you can do whatever you want to do, but we will not leave our streets for you. We will outnumber you. But still, if you look at the polls about the elections next year, you see the Swedish Democrats, which is the right wing, or the extreme, the extreme right wing, because they are getting more and more extreme. They are really in the rise in Sweden now, almost with the, the last polls saying up to 20%. So you really see just in two years how this extreme right and the right wing and the neo-Nazis just used the humanitarian crisis to win over and to brainwash people about jobs, about our values, Although I'm someone who's always, when I hear the term European values, I get very allergic. I'm like, please say universal values, global values, human rights values. Because if you say European values, you have a mass population in Europe voting for right wing and extreme right. So this makes it also European values. So let's talk about human rights, human values, um, instead of just being selective or elitist about yeah, these kind of debates. I mean, without culture, we cannot live. I mean, it's, it's, it's like air, like water. We, I mean, how will I be able to know you if I don't watch or if I don't know about your culture? And this is why with our project, and I'm, I'm really happy that the EU is dedicating a lot of money which is not enough, we want more. We want more to show cultures because, I mean, integration will only happen if it's both ways. When the Syrian will know about the Swede and when the Swede will know about the Afghan and when the Spanish will know about the Iranian and the Egyptian and so on. And what I see at the moment, it's um, intercultural dialogue or intercultural exchange, mostly as someone living in Sweden, like you see it between Swedes and Iranians, for example, Swedes and Afghans. But I'm dreaming about Swedes and Afghans and Syrians who would like to know also about the Afghans living in Sweden and the Iranians who would be interested to know about the Iraqi culture. So it become a multi-culti, <laughs> multicultural, not just intercultural. We need, we need culture. I mean, like name any civilization that did not become a civilization because they didn't have a big culture to spread. Um, we need it. We need to get voices heard. We need people to feel safe to express their culture because sometimes they might feel like, oh, I don't know, maybe they will find the two Christian or too Muslim or too whatever, and we will receive a threat. People should really feel safe to practice their culture. Yeah. Um, I just want to say something about Ihop because I think I just gave the definition, but maybe I can just explain what it is. Um, Ihop, it's a, a mashup 
of uh, two Swedish words about togetherness and about hope. It's, um, it's a creative project that is led by the National Museums of World Culture in Sweden. Uh, we are trying to use, or we try to use digital storytelling uh, to facilitate integration. We wanted to build an intercultural dialogue platform where people can share stories from their childhood, from their presence, from their dreams, what they want to be in the future. Um, we did this project in, in Gothenburg in 2017 where we filmed 26 people and each story is one minute long, which, which was not easy at all to like make it together in one minute. We faced a lot of challenges, but it was very hopeful and um, it was very touching to hear about a man who escaped with his daughter after a bomb fell on their home. And to hear the story of a French tango dancer dancing tango in Istanbul. Or to hear the story of a Swedish woman who was so happy that her daughter was helping her at the kitchen. So it was a big diversity of stories. And it showed that every story matters. No matter how emotional, how dramatic, how it matters. It means something to the person. I myself, I took part and I said a story. I told a story in this project. A story that I never thought I would remember. That moment in my life still, after four years, this very particular moment. And it's fantastic how storytelling can bring us together and you can see like, oh, me too. So it's really powerful and I really, really recommend people to, to try to test it out and see fantastic results. Yeah, thanks.